Hey everyone, welcome back. Today we are going to be going over chapter three, which is physiology and histology of the skin. I hope that you have been enjoying this series of theory videos. We are working out of our standard My Lady's Esthetician book and we are on page 83. Describe why learning the physiology and histology of the skin makes you a better esthetician. So let's begin. Estheticians have an opportunity to study a most fascinating science. Skin histology and physiology involves a study of the anatomy, layers, and functions of the skin. Recall that chapter two defined physiology as the study of the functions and activities performed by the body's structure, including physical and chemical process. Histology is also known as the microscopic anatomy. The study of the structure and compositions of tissues. So skin physiology and histology involves the study of the structure and composition of the skin's tissue. Estheticians who specialize in the health and beauty of skin are sometimes referred to as technicians, skin therapists, or specialists. There is much more to being an esthetician than simply performing facials and selling products. As scientific research in the industry changes and advances constantly, new understandings of how the skin functions and interacts with new technologies are emerging. How other body systems are integrally linked with the integumentary system are being revealed as researchers look for new ways to treat chronic diseases and disorders, work on anti-aging efforts, and battle cancer. Estheticians must commit to being lifelong learners. Clients value an esthetician's comprehensive understanding of the skin in general. Committing to becoming a skin expert means you develop an understanding of your client's unique skin characteristics and responses. You can make personalized treatments, recommendation, and prescribe a home care regimen that will help keep the skin healthy and vibrant. By educating clients, estheticians are sharing their knowledge and expertise. An esthetician's primary focus is on preserving, protecting, and nourishing the skin. Estheticians should study and have a thorough understanding of the physiology and histology of the skin because the complexity of the skin is astonishing. The layers, the components, the functions all work with the body system to protect and regulate the skin and other parts of the body. The study of skin physiology and histology includes learning about the aging process as well as interpreting the effects of ultraviolet damage, okay, UV rays, hormonal influences, and nutrition on the skin's health. Each of these factors affect the skin's health and its appearance. There is much to study about the body's largest organ and how to best maintain its optimum health and with a deeper understanding. The skin therapist can confidently treat this sophisticated system. All right, so again, every single chapter is connected. The more you know, the better you will become at being a skin care therapist, as it's saying, an esthetician. You want to have a lot of knowledge and it all starts here. Describe the attributes of healthy skin. I hope that everything you are seeing in the chapter that you are highlighting and put it in a star next to everything. Again, all of this will simply help you answer your chapter three test questions. All right, skin or the integumentary system is the largest organ in the body. It is strong barrier designed to protect us from the outside elements, skin layers, nerves, cellular functions, hair follicles, and glands all work together to regulate and protect the body. Hormone, hormone growth factors and other biochemical control the skin's intricate functions. 
The basic material and building blocks of our body's tissues are proteins. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. Amino acids form peptides, and peptides form proteins. Proteins have many roles in maintaining our skin's health. Our skin is an industrious manufacturer with miles, blood vessels, millions of sweat glands, and an array of nerves within a network of fibers. Appendages of the skin include hair, nails, sweat glands, and oil glands. Healthy skin is slightly moist, soft, smooth, and even somewhat acidic. Distinguishing the six primary functions of the skin. We're on page 86. The skin is similar to a multifunction tool. You guys, it acts as a shield for the body. It is waterproof and an insulator that protects the body against extreme heat, cold, and damaging UV rays. Skin is a barrier that protects against harmful chemicals and bacteria, preventing infection. Skin plays an important role in bone health by producing vitamin D. In addition, our skin is a huge sensory storehouse that keeps our brain, okay, our brain in touch with the world around us. Skin does all of this while being flexible enough for the body to engage in motion while maintaining a healthy exterior to allow us to look good and feel comfortable. For these reasons, the six primary functions of the skin are sensation, protection, heat regulation, excretion, secretion, and absorption. Please remember those, that's very important. So let's start with sensation. Touch is one of the first senses to develop. Nerve fibers in the skin sense where we are touched, okay? So depending on the type of stimulation, sensation felt on our skin causes us to feel, react, or sometimes even move, right? So different nerve sensors help us to detect different sensations and perceive changes in our environment, such as heat, cold, touch, pain, and pressure. Nerve sensors send messages to the brain and motor nerves send messages back to rely to the body on basically on how to respond. The sensation of heat will cause us to pull away from a hot burning stove, for example. A massage sends messages to the brain through nerve stimulation and lowers stress in the body as well as promotes circulation. Studies have shown stress reduction in babies and older adults when they experience more touch and interaction with others. Sensory nerve fibers are most abundant in your fingertips and are designed to be one of the most sensitive parts of the body. Again, highlight that and put a star next to it. All right, let's keep going. Now let's talk about protection. How does our skin protect us? So the skin, you guys, is thin yet very strong. Protective barrier to outside elements and microorganisms. It has many defense mechanisms to protect the body from injury and also invasion. Sebum, sebum, which is oil, okay? Sebum is oil on the epidermis gives protection from external factors such as invasion by certain bacteria. The acid mantle is the protective barrier, you guys, that is made up of sebum, lipids, sweat, and water. These components form what is called a hydrolipidic film to protect the skin from drying out and from exposure to external factors that could damage it. Hydro means water. Lipidic means oil. 
So a hydrolipidic film provides a oil water balance on the surface of the skin. So that means that we have to protect our acid mantle. That is why sometimes over stripping our skin out of these good oils is not good. All right, because then we don't have the protection our skin actually needs. All right, so keep that in mind. The acid mantle has an average pH of 5.5. The balanced pH of the skin is important to protect the body from pathogens and to regulate enzymatic functions. The acid mantle is part of the skin's natural barrier function. The barrier function is the skin's mechanism that protects us from irritation and intercellular transepidermal water loss. You are going to see this throughout your career. You need to know what transepidermal water loss is. The water loss caused by evaporation on the skin surface. Lipids are substances that contribute to the barrier function of the epidermis. Lipids are protective oils that are part of the intercellular matrix between the epidermal cells. So damage to the barrier layer is the cause of many skin problems, including sensitivities, aging, and also dehydration. So you guys, look at the picture that show that is shown on page 88. Normal skin, damaged skin. Okay, so we have to protect our barrier function so that we do not suffer from transepidermal water loss, okay? Melanocytes are the cells that produce pigment and protect our bodies from harmful ionizing UV rays. Melanocytes produce pigment granules called melanosomes. Melanosomes produce a protein called melanin. Melanin travels from the deeper basal layer, okay, of the stratum germinativum, again, also called the basal layer, to the surface through finger-like projections called dendrites acting as an umbrella to shield the skin from the negative effects of the sun and indoor tanning. UV rays can damage the DNA in melanocytes and can cause skin cancer. The three types of skin cancer are, of course, discussed in Chapter 4, Disorders and Diseases of the Skin. The skin's most amazing feature is the ability to heal itself. Skin can repair itself when injured, thus protecting the body from infection and damage from injury. Through a hyperproduction of cells and blood clotting, injured skin can restore itself to its once normal thickness, you guys. Hormones such as an epidermal growth factor okay, also known as EGF, stimulates skin cells to reproduce and heal, okay? Proteins and peptide trigger what is called fibroblast, okay? Fibroblast and cells to rejuvenate. Skin cells are activated to quickly repair the skin, other protective components of the skin include cells active in the immune system. This process is discussed later in this chapter, okay? So again, all of that is discussing protection. Now let's talk about heat, heat regulation. So the body's average internal thermostat, you guys, is set at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. When the outside temperature changes, the skin automatically adjusts to warm or cool the body as necessary. The body maintains a thermal regulation through evaporation, perspiration, radiation, and insulation. 
millions of sweat glands release heat from the body through perspiration to keep us from overheating, okay? We then cool ourselves through evaporation on the skin surface. Blood flow and blood vessels dilation also assist in cooling the body. We protect ourselves from the cold by constricting of the blood vessels and decreasing blood flow. Additionally, the body's fat layers help to insulate and warm the body. Hair follicles also help regulate body temperature and protect from heat loss. When we are cold, the erector pili muscle, okay, attached to the hair follicles, they contract and cause goosebumps in our skin. And I think we've all experienced that before. This reaction is thought to warm the skin by the air pockets that are created under the hairs that stand up when the muscles contract. Shivering is also an automatic response to cold and a way to warm up the body. Excretion. So excretion, the sudafarious gland, also known as your sweat glands. Again, the sudafarious glands are known as your sweat glands. It excretes perspiration. Many people believe that sweat detoxifies the body, but less than 1% of the body detoxification actually comes through perspiration. Your pseudophorous glands serve to prevent the body from overheating. The liver and kidneys do the detox work, okay? Heavy sweating can cause a loss of fluid, dehydration, and the loss of the mineral balance needed to keep the body functioning optimally. So, Sweat, just like sebum, is also part of the acid mantle, okay? The functions of these glands are discussed later in this chapter. Now let's talk about secretion. Sebum is an oily substance that protects the surface of the skin and also lubricates both the skin and the hair. Sebaceous glands also known as your oil, okay, your oil glands, are appendages attached to the follicles that produce sebum. These oils help keep the skin soft and protect it from outside elements. The skin, you guys, is approximately 50 to 70% water. Sebum coating the surface of the skin slows down the evaporation of water, also known as the, once again, transepidermal water loss, and helps maintain appropriate water levels in the cells. Emotional stress and hormone imbalances can stimulate oil glands to increase the flow of sebum which can then lead to skin problems, you guys, such as acne breakouts, okay? That is why if you've ever been going through a tough time where you find yourself being really stressed and you're like, oh my God, my skin is breaking out, that is why. All right, absorption. Absorption of chemicals, hormones, moisture, and oxygen is necessary for our skin's health. Vitamin D is also synthesized and produced in the skin upon exposure to sun. The skin selectively absorbs topical products, serums, and creams through the hair, excuse me, through the cells, hair follicles, and sebaceous glands. While absorption is limited, some ingredients with a smaller molecular size can penetrate the skin a little bit deeper. The penetration's ability of the ingredient is determined by the size of the molecule and other characteristics of the actual product, okay? Lipid-soluble products penetrate better. The routes of penetration are through the follicle walls, sebaceous glands, 
intercellular or transcellular. Small molecules with permeable cells wall can penetrate the cells. Larger cells with non-permeable cells walls can be temporarily absorbed by the glands in the skin and can travel through the intercellular spaces. And there are your examples right there. So yeah, obviously something like a moisturizer, I'm pretty sure the molecular size of a moisturizer will be a lot larger. So it will tend to sit more on top of the skin to keep it moist. But something like a serum, for example, its molecular size will be a lot smaller. So therefore, it will be able to penetrate the skin a lot better. I hope that makes sense. Absorption of select topical products help keep skin moisturized, nourish, and protect it. Scientific advances continually result in the creation of new products that are more readily absorbed by the skin, thus making them more effective. New nanotechnology transforms skincare products, micronizing the particles so they're able to penetrate further into the skin. Many skincare ingredients, including prescription creams, can penetrate the skin's uh, deeper layers. This effect can be either harmful or, of course, beneficial, depending on the elements in the topical application and its purpose and function, right? So, all right, we are now on page 91. Explain the function of each layer of the skin from the deepest to the surface. So we are going to start from the bottom and work ourselves up. So I hope you are following along. I hope everything is making sense. This is definitely a chapter that you do not want to go over only once. You have to read this chapter multiple times. I promise you that as you progress in your aesthetic career, all of this will make a lot more sense. So if you're listening to me read, which is absolutely fine, I know you can obviously read this on your own as well, but as you're listening to me read, I promise you that perhaps three, four, even five months from now, you go back and you read this again, you're going to be like, wow, I get it now. Everything makes more sense. That's how it always is, you guys. So you have to read this multiple times. All right, so let's keep going. The skin comprises of three main components. We have the hypodermis, or what is called the subcutaneous layer. Then you have the dermis, and of course, the epidermis. We are going to start again at the deepest layer and work our way towards the surface. So again, from the bottom to the top. So Subcutaneous tissue, the subcutaneous layer, also known as the hypodermis or superficial okay, layer. It's composed of loose connective tissue or subcutis tissue, also known as adipose tissue. This layer is about 80% fat. This tissue creates a protective cushion that gives contour and smoothness to the body. And it is also a source of energy for the body, vessels, nerves, fibers, adipose cells, and fibroblasts are just some of the components of the hypodermis. This layer decreases and thins out with age. Yes, I know. A client with a thick subcutaneous layer may have an underlying hormonal disorder and will deserve further exploration when you perform your skin care consultation. So fat storage in the body is also influenced by hormones and may be reflected, for example, by acneic breakout, hair growth, excessive oiliness, or even dryness. All right, now let's get into the dermis. So the dermis, also called the derma or corium, okay, or true skin, is the support layer of connective tissues just above the hypodermis. The dermis, which is about 25 times thicker than the epidermis, consists of two layers, 
the reticular layer, below the papillary layer, above the dermis primarily comprises of connective tissues made up of collagen, protein, and elastin fibers. The dermis supplies the skin with oxygen and nutrients through a network of blood vessels and lymphatic channels, okay? Then we have the reticular layer. The reticular layer is a much denser and deeper layer of the dermis. Again, it is comprised mainly of collagen and elastin. So damage, you guys, to these elastin fibers as they break down is the primary cause of sagging skin, wrinkles, and intrinsic aging, loss of elasticity in the skin, also stretch marks, okay? Stretch marks are caused by damage to our elastin fibers. Collagen and elastin are broken down by UV, ultraviolet UV damage, smoking, and environmental influences such as air pollution. Then we have the papillary layer. The papillary layer connects the dermis to the epidermis. The dermal papillae are membranes of ridges and grooves that attach to the epidermis. Attached to the dermal papillae are either lube capillaries that nourish the epidermis or tactical carpocells, the nerve endings sensitive to touch and pressure. Note that the papillae in the hair follicle are called hair papillae and are the small cone-shaped structure at the bottom of the hair follicle. The blood supplies nourishment within the skin through capillaries. The papillary layer comprises 10 to 20% of the dermis. Collagen and elastin are loose and are more widely spaced here than it is in the reticular layer. Collagen is a protein substance of complex fibers that gives the skin its strength and is necessary, you guys, for wound healing. Produced by fibroblasts, collagen makes up 70% of the dermis. The fibroblast cells produce proteins and aid in the production of collagen and elastin. In contrast, elastin makes up a small percentage of the dermis. There is approximately 1 15th the amount of elastin compared to the amount of collagen. Elastin is the fibrous protein that forms elastic tissue and gives our skin its elasticity. Glycocosaminoglycans are large protein molecules and water binding substances found between the fibers of the dermis. GAGs, again, glycocosaminoglycans, are polysaccharides, that is protein and sugar complexes. Glycocosaminoglycans work to maintain and support collagen and elastin in cellular spaces keeping protein fibers in balance. They also help collagen and elastin retain its moisture. They interact with copper peptides in our, in our systems for cellular repair. A healthy fluid intake is essential to keep the GAGs functioning properly. Beneficial hydrating fluids, such as hyaluronic acid, are part of the dermal substance. Hyaluronic acid is a GAG. Ingredients that duplicate these natural intercellular fluids are important in aesthetics and skincare products and are discussed in other chapters. Blood and lymph vessels, capillaries, follicles, sebaceous glands, pseudophorous glands, sensory nerve, additional receptors, and the erector pili muscle are all located in the dermis. 
lymph vessels remove waste product, bacteria, and excess fluid. Fibroblast cells, um, cell stimulators, lymphocytes, which are infection fighters, Langerhans cells, which are uh, guard cells, mast cells, which involved in an allergic reaction, and leukocytes, which are white blood cells to fight infections, are all found in the dermis. Other components give tautness or firmness to the skin by interacting with elastin and hyaluronic acid. Hormones such as the epidermal growth factor and fibroblast growth factor stimulate fibroblast cells, proteins, and DNA synthesis. You guys, in the dermis is a fluid called extracellular matrix composed of collagen, other proteins, and GAGs. These intercellular substances comprise fluid with other components to maintain balance, provide dermal support, and also assist cell metabolism, growth, and migration. Next, we are going to talk about the dermal epidermal junction. So the dermal epidermal junction, what it does, it connects the dermis to the epidermis. This junction consists of layers of connective collagen tissue with many small pockets and holes. Collagen fibrils from the dermis are embedded into these layers to provide strength and adhesion. Keratin filaments on the epidermis side also ensure strength and adhesion to the junction. Some states define the esthetician's scope of practice as, meaning not beyond the DEJ, meaning the esthetician cannot treat the skin beyond the epidermis. Okay. All right. Now let's talk about the epidermis. The epidermis is the outermost layer of the skin. This is the epithelial tissue that covers our body. It is thin, protective covering with many nerve endings. The epidermis is composed of five layers, okay, called strata. Singular will be stratum, all right? So as you can as you guys can see the picture here on page bottom of page 94. Again, I hope you are still following along with me. All right. So, we have stratum germinativum, okay? The germination of growth layer, which is the bottom layer also known as the basal cell layer. So you will hear a lot of times people refer to the stratum germinativum as the basal layer. Just know that it is the same layer, okay? Then we have the stratum spinosum, which is called the spiny, spiny cell layer. Then you have the stratum granulosum, also known as the grainy cell layer. Then you have stratum lucidum, known as the clear layer, okay? Present only where the skin is thick, which will be on the soles of the feet and the palms of your hands, okay? Then you have the stratum corneum, which is the horny layer, which is the layer that us estheticians, we are constantly working on. This is the layer that we are constantly exfoliating, okay? Understanding how the skin cell layers function is important, okay? In choosing ingredients and of course, even choosing treatments. Estheticians, scope of practice, reference working on the epidermis and not the dermis, okay? We have to stay on the epidermis, you guys. Unless, of course, you are working under the direction of a physician or other licensed medical practitioners, such as a nurse practitioner um, or a physician's assistant, for example. All right, let's keep going. Keratinocytes, please highlight that and put a star next to it. Composed of keratin, comprise 95% of the epidermis. 
these cells contain both protein and lipids. Surrounding the cells in the epidermis are lipids, which protect the cells from water loss and dehydration. Then we have keratin. is a fibrous protein that provides resiliency and protection. Keratin is found in all layers of the epidermis. Hard keratin is the protein, you guys, that is found in hair and nails. Again, that's hard keratin. Keratinocytes have many different functions and go through changes as they move up through the layers to the top layer of the stratum corneum. Stem cells are the mother cells that divide in the basal layer or stratum germinativum. Again, you see they're using both terms interchangeably. They're talking about the same layer. Forming new daughter cells. You guys, these daughter cells move up through the layers before becoming hardened corneocytes of the stratum corneum. Keratinocytes and other cells protect the epidermis. Other cells in the epidermis include melanocytes, immune cells, lamellar granules, and Merkel cells, which are known as nerve receptors. Then we have stratum germinativum. The stratum germinativum, also known as the basal cell layer. It is located right above the dermis. It is composed of a single layer of basal cells laying on a basement membrane. In this active layer, stem cells undergo continuous cell division, also known as mitosis, to replenish the skin cells that are regularly shed from the surface. Stem cells are basically mother cells that divide to produce daughter cells in a remarkable process. Mother cells divide to form two daughter cells. Some of these stem cells and daughter cells always remain undifferentiated and keep dividing for constant self-renewal over a lifetime. These either remain stem cells or they are programmed to become something else, such as a keratinocyte. In the body, some daughter cells go on to become skin cells, other cells become glands, follicles, tissue, or even organs. Daughter cells that are not able to divide anymore have the capability to program themselves to end up as one specific type of cell. This is known as terminal differentiation. Cells such as these keratinocytes began their journey of terminal differentiation as they migrate to the surface and eventually become strong and protective. Cells in the basal layer produce the necessary lipids that form cell membranes and hold the cells together. Merkel cells, okay, are touch receptors also located in the basal layer. The stratum germinativum also contain melanocytes, which are cells that produce pigment, meaning color, granules in the basal layer. About five to 10% of the basal cells are melanocytes. The pigment carrying granules called melanosomes then produce a complex protein called melanin, which determines your skin, eye, and hair color. Amazing, right? All right, let's move on to the stratum spinosum. So the stratum spinosum, also known as the spiny layer, is above the stratum germinativum. Cells continue to divide and change uh, shape in this layer. The enzymes are creating lipids and proteins. 
cell appendages which resemble prickly spines become desmosomes, the intercellular structures that assist in strengthening and holding the cells together. Desmosomes are keratin filaments, the protein bonds that create the junction between the cells. These strengthen the epidermis and assist in intercellular communication. Also found here are Langerin immune cells, which protect our body, you guys, from infection by identifying foreign materials, okay, antigens. The immune cells help destroy these foreign invaders. Keratinocytes and melanocytes work in, work in synergy here, forming the even placement of pigment granules. Lamellar granules are cells that contain lipids to maintain the barrier function. The spinosum is the largest layer of the epidermis. Now let's talk about the stratum granulosum. The stratum granulosum, also known as the granular layer, is composed of cells that resemble granules and are filled with keratin. The production of keratin in intercellular lipids also take place here in this layer. Enzymes dissolve the structures, desmosomes, that hold the cells together. As these cells become keratinized, they move up to the surface and what happens? They replace the cells shed from the stratum corneum. Naturally, moisturizing substances such as triglycerides, ceramides, waxes, fatty acids, and other intercellular lipids are made here and are excreted from cells to form components of the skin's waterproofing barrier function of the top layer. These water-soluble compounds are referred to as natural moisturizing factors and hydrate the lipid layer surrounding cells, absorb water, and prevent water loss to keep our skin nicely hydrated. Now let's talk about the stratum lucidum. It is a thin, clear, that is your keyword, clear layer of dead skin cells under the stratum corneum. It is translucent layer made up of small cells that let light pass through. This layer, you guys, is the thickest on the palms of our hands and the soles of our feet. The, keratinized, the keratinocytes in this layer contain clear keratin. The cells here release lipids forming bilayers of oil and water. The thicker skin on the palms and soles is composed of epidermal ridges that provide a better grip while walking and using our hands. This layer also form our unique fingerprints and footprints. Then we have the stratum corneum, also known as the horny layer. It's the top outermost layer of the epidermis. The estheticians work primarily extensively in this layer. The stratum corneum is very thin, yet it is waterproof and permeable. It regenerates itself, detoxifies the body, it responds to stimuli. Keratinocytes on the surface have hardened um, into corneocytes, the waterproof protective cells. These dead protein cells have dried out and they lack nuclei. This layer is referred to as a horny layer because of these scale-like cells. Keratinocytes are continually shed from the skin in a process called, remember this one, you guys, desquamation, okay? Desquamation. These cells are replaced by new cells that are coming, okay, from the lower stratum up to the surface of the skin. This process of desquamation and replacement is known as cell turn 
over. Remember that our cell turnover rate, okay? The average adult cell turnover rate, it's about every 28 days, depending on that person's age, lifestyle, and even their health. The cell turnover rate slows down as we age. Average cell turnover rate for a baby, for example, is about 14 days. In your teens, your cells are replaced every three to four weeks. By the time you are over 50, your cell turnover rate has slowed down to maybe every 42 to 84 days. That is a big difference. So understanding the process of cell turnover will help you make better decisions about how to treat aging skin. And that is why we exfoliate our skin, we moisturize our skin, we try to keep our skin nicely balanced. That is why we also do and offer chemical peels to help with our cell turnover rate, especially as we are getting older. We want to make sure that we are giving that our skin that boost it needs to help regenerate newer cells, right? So our skin can still feel very smooth and look resilient, right? And more youthful. I hope that makes sense. Cells and oil combine to form a protective barrier layer on the stratum corneum. Lamellar granules are secreted from keratinocytes, resulting in the formation of an impermeable, okay, lipid-containing membrane that serves as a water barrier and is required for correct skin barrier function. These bodies release components that are required for skin shedding, again, desquamation, in the stratum corneum. This is the acid mantle. Stratum corneum cells are surrounded by bilayers of oil and water. Lipids of the cell membrane, such as phospholipids and essential fatty acids, determine the health of this protective barrier. So to clarify, a bilayer is a thin polar membrane made of two layers of lipid molecules. These membranes are flat sheets that form a continuous barrier around all cells. Cell membranes of almost all living organisms and many viruses are made of a lipid bilayer, as are the membranes surrounding the cell nucleus and other subcellular structures. In general, the stratum corneum has 15 to 20 layers of cells. The stratum corneum has a thickness between 0.01 and 0.04 millimeters. The keratinocytes on the surface of the skin, also called squamous, flat, scaly, keratinized cells. There are different terms used to describe the same cell. So it is helpful to remember these surface cells that are, they're both flat and hardened, okay? Squamous and corneified. Now let's talk about skin color melanin, melanocytes, and melasnosomes. Melanin is the pigment that protects us from the sun. Every person has the same number of melanocytes or pigment producing cells. Both internal and external factors affect melanin activation and production. Difference in genetic skin color are due to the amount of melanin activated in the skin and the way it is distributed. Individuals with darker skin and melanin have more activity in their melanocytes. This is an example of an internal factor. An external factor influencing melanin production is sun exposure. Melanin production is stimulated by exposure to sunlight and protects the cells below by absorbing and blocking UV radiation. Melanocyte cells make melanosome spheres, 
which are transferred to keratinocytes. Melanosomes carry the pigment granule that provide the skin's color. One melanocyte will deposit pigment carrying melanosomes into about 30 keratinocytes through its dendrites. Dendrites are like the arms or cellular protections that branch out to interact with other cells in the extracellular matrix between the cells. Okay. This process is how pigment darkening happens. You guys, tyrosinase, please remember that word. Tyrosinase is the enzyme that stimulates melanocytes and thus produce melanin. It is estimated that there are over 1,000 melanocytes per square millimeter of skin. The body produces two types of melanin. Please remember this. The first one is pheomelanin, which is red or yellow in color, and eumelanin, which is dark brown to black. People with light color skin mostly produce pheomelanin, while those with darker color skin mostly produce eomelanin. Individuals with fair skin have approximately 20 melanosomes per keratinocytes. And people with dark skin have about 200 melanosomes per keratinocytes. That is a big difference. Products that suppress melanin production is inter interrupting biochemical process are referred to as brightening agents. Some are called tyrosinase inhibitors. These products are designed to help reduce hyperpigmentation. Pigmentation disorders is obviously discussed in chapter four. Products and treatments for hyperpigmentation are also discussed in other chapters. We have covered a lot of information so far. A summary of the main components of the skin, including their respective layers and functions, is also provided here. Well, I know that's been a lot, a lot of information, but I do want to point out, so yes, there are a lot of products that are considered tyrosinase inhibitors. And um, I have a few here with me, and I'm just going to show you guys, uh, what did I do with it? Um, so we have this one. This is from Glymet. It's called Diamond Bright Skin Lightener. Um, Diamond Bright Skin Lightener reduces pigmentation and brightens the skin through cutting edge technology, evening out skin tone, dark spots for a younger and smoother looking complexion. So again, this is safe for all skin type and it is a product that I absolutely love. All right. Then you have something like the derma pigment bleaching fluid do not let the word bleaching uh scare you it does contain two percent hydroquinone now hydroquinone is a little bit controversial this is not something that you will use forever obviously it's not recommended that anyone uses hydroquinone for over a year all right so you do have to give your skin a break and a lot of times, tyrosinase inhibitors products do make you very sun sensitive. So you must be aware that you have to stay away from direct sunlight and, of course, use sun protection. Okay. Um, but again, you guys, there's a lot of other uh, products out there. You just have to do some research. I have several. Um, I just don't have them very here close to me. But again, that was just to show you guys a few. All right, so we are going to come to a stop on page 99. We are going to continue on page 100 here shortly. If you would like to keep watching, please look for video number two. Thank you so much for watching. If you have found this helpful, please don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys in a second.